this morning. I want to move on and talk about uh, this story which will affect pretty much all of us actually, which is the continuing strikes by junior doctors and now in tandem with senior doctors with consultants. Consultants and junior doctors will now strike together during the Conservative Party conference. This is a, an announcement by the British Medical Association, that's the body that oversees doctors or the trade union for doctors. And these strikes uh, both together will take place on September the 20th, October the 2nd, 3rd and 4th. And what that means is they will only provide Christmas Day cover. Now many people are saying this shows that clearly these strikes are politically motivated. Dr Vivek Trivedi, he's the BMA Junior Doctor Committee co-chairman, said they will also now hold a national rally in Manchester on October the 3rd on the doorstep of the Conservative Party conference. Just to remind you, the junior doctors are saying they want 35% pay uplift. Now, the independent pay review body has come back at about 8%, 8.3, 8.8% or thereabouts. So there is a massive gulf between the two of them. There are strong arguments to say that junior doctors should be paid more. But where I think this argument starts to fall flat is when consultants, where when you look at the average salary, salary uh, is about 100 134,000, they're in the top 2% of earners, they also want a 35% pay uplift. Well, joining us now is Dr Bob Gill, who's an NHS GP and producer of the documentary The Great NHS Heist. Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, your thoughts on where we are, we've got now the, I think, the sixth strike by junior doctors, the second strike by consultants. We have 7.6 million people waiting for elective procedures, a million appointments now cancelled as a result of these strikes. People are pretty fed up. Sure, well, let's not forget how we got here. Um, what the doctors are asking for is pay restoration. They've had real terms wage contraction over the past decade since the austerity programme of this government. Uh, and what they're wanting to do is get back to where they would have been had they not had their pages stolen from them by government policy. Now, the only way for a worker to um, achieve some negotiation with government and with management is to withdraw their labour. There is no other mechanism. Now, there doesn't have to be a strike. The government could come to the table and have serious negotiations rather than what they're actually doing, which is perpetuating industrial action. Now, you said this is getting political. Well, you know, if you're in a negotiation, you're going to act to uh, ratchet up the pressure on the government in power. But it's not party political because, unfortunately, the Labour Party seem to be endorsing all the policies of this government, which includes privatisation of the NHS and you know contracting well, well, the way let, let, let me yeah. just jump in there because of course the the fundamental principle is that care remains free at the point of need now there's always been private service provision as part of that gps are private uh, entities that are contracted by the nhs so i don't buy that in terms of money though we spend a lot of money on the nhs 11.1 percent of gdp it's up there with all of the european countries so it's not really about money i accept that actually the junior doctors are not getting a fair share but how can you justify a 35% pay uplift when people are struggling, working people haven't had pay rises, are struggling to put food on the table and struggling to heat their homes. If you're in the NHS, you have a ring-fenced income. Right, so the consultants have suffered the worst real terms pay cut. They earn £134,000. But they've suffered a 30% real terms wage cut. You're not comparing consultants in this country with consultants in America and Australia. Sure. Relatively speaking, these are highly qualified people who can be very mobile and they're voting with their feet. They're exiting the NHS. There is a recruitment and retention crisis. You're misframing the NHS principles. The principle isn't free at the point of uh, use. The principle is public provision. No, it and isn't. It's free at the point of use. That's no, the whole idea of Bevan's no, it principle. Isn't. No, it isn't. It's public provision pro provided by people trained within the NHS. That's absolute by, nonsense. Employed by the NHS and delivered by the NHS. Now, no, you, that is, I'm sorry, I'm mention, sorry, that is utter bunkum. What you fail to mention is we've had a stealth privatisation, successive legislation. Now we have money hemorrhaging the NHS well, I, OK, fine, but let, let's just talk about private provision. The of the market. Well, let's just talk about private provision. I'd sure. argue that actually private provision is better than the NHS because it's more efficient. I know you get through far more operations and there's more accountability. 
Well, that's total nonsense. If you look at the most privatised system in the world, the American system... I'm not talking about the American how, system, I'm talking about know, our well, system. How convenient, how convenient for you not to talk about the American system, because that's the system we have copied in legislation. That's an insurance-based system. I, OK, well, we're switching to an insurance-based system. No, by we're not. Mounting waiting list, people are opting to take out private insurance or paying out of their pocket. The government will never be explicit about its intentions because it's electoral suicide. Not just the government, but the Labour Party are totally on board with this t betrayal of the public interest. And I've been studying this for a decade. Look at the legislation we've had in July 2022, the Health and Social Care Act, which has in law now replicated 42 public private entities which will be controlled by private corporations. That is the reality. And I'm sorry if you haven't kept up with the legislation, but I have. That's incredibly disingenuous, by the way. And actually, I think what people want in this country is great care. They don't care who the, who actually provides that care. It should well, be they free. Do care. No, they and don't we, care. They, had, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. They a want it free at the point of need. They want to be seen. It is unacceptable to wait two years to see a doctor to get your treatment. It isn't well, exactly. working. The NHS is fundamentally flawed. Well, you are, you are, you're implying that I like waiting lists. The governments have created the waiting list. It was beyond 5 million before the pandemic, before any industrial action. The government has defunded the NHS. Rubbish. 11.1% of GDP. Rubbish. But, but where is it going, David? Well, let David? me just bring in Dr. Rene. Let me bring in Dr. Rene, who may be slightly calmer than me. Well, I'm not as spiky as you, it would seem. <laughs> so morning. It would seem. morning, Dr. Gill. Morning. Um, look. I, I don't agree with obviously much of what you say in the way that the NHS is funded because I do believe that we it is now doing what it sh didn't need to do, it doesn't need to do. The founding principle of the NHS was free at the point of need by Bevan and I've just looked it up just to double check As I that. said. And David was absolutely right. But we have extended the scope, we are overloaded with bureaucracy, we um, have many, many more managers than we need and we need to reform it from the bottom up. We don't need to plough more money in and hope, against hope, that it all just starts working again. That's my view. And when you have people earning £130,000 a year who may be better valued in other countries, I'm afraid in this time of need for them to come out on strike with the junior doctors at the same time is actually saying to the public, we don't care if you die because of what we do. So let me come back on that. I agree with you about the bureaucracy. Mm, As I, I think said earlier, the, the NHS has been marketised. The cost of the bureaucracy is leaching out at least 10% of what should be going to patient care. The legislation has repurposed the NHS. And, you know, when Bevan founded the NHS, it wasn't outsourced to private companies. Everybody working within the NHS was a public employee. You could control well, that, policy, that's you not could actually, control training. That's not actually true. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna interject because that's not actually true because GPs have always been outside of the employees. Okay, the so NHS. where were these GPs trained? They were trained within the NHS. That, that's every, a different point. Totally. Every part of their GPs activity, are still trained within the system, sure, but they are every, private contractors. Every part of their activity is controlled by the NHS. They don't have but they're still private contractors. They don't have shareholders. Do you they agree they are private contractors? No, they're independent contractors. So they're because private they're not, contractors? They're not private because they don't set their own terms. They don't what? individually negotiate. It's a national negotiation. But in 2004, under the new Labour government, there was a massive change in the GP contract, which allowed private providers to come in, like Virgin, like everybody else, to provide uh, urgent care uh, prov provision. So each government, Tory and Labour, has by stealth repurposed the NHS. If only more people could see what was going on. I think we, we have some common ground. The bureaucracy is totally avoidable, as is the cost of servicing mm -hmm. private finance initiative debt, which the governments have deliberately saddled the NHS with. Well, that was under Tony Blair, the PFI initiative. I agree with that far too much management. It was also, accelerated. It was Vegas. accelerated. Also, the other thing, and I've said this repeatedly, I, I welcome the government training more doctors from 7,500 a year up to 15,000. We've had a policy of nicking doctors from other countries, which quite frankly isn't acceptable. Let's get take a call, though, uh, because passions are running high. Steve is in London. Good morning to you, Steve. Uh, good morning, sir. Morning. Um, right, your thoughts. Um, my my thoughts are that um, 
uh, and I've said to your researcher that it's a bit like moving next to an airport and then complaining about the noise in terms of strikes. Um, if you uh, if 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 you apply for a job, you go through five years training. Uh, you know what the salary is going to be, um, and then mm-hmm. once you've got the job, you then go on strike and complain about the salary. Let me put it's that. Sure. Let me put that to Bob. Doctors knew what they were getting into is essentially uh, what Steve's saying. Yeah, so I suppose these clairvoyant doctors also knew that inflation was going to go through the roof. But no one knew that. They also predicted maybe the interest rates are going to go up. They also... What about bricklayers? What about people who work uh, in in the caring community, for example, all those people who haven't had a pay rise? They should have had. Well, they didn't. We have because it's the real problem. world. Because people well, we, haven't you know, had pay can, rises. Can I, well, I, either we well, either we endorse the neglect of our, our senior citizens, or Bob, we pay care, care workers enough money. You can't have Bob, it both. Bob, yeah. can I intersect here? So I'm a GP. Sure. Obviously, yeah. I I work as a portfolio GP, so I'm self-employed. I have not had a pay rise for seven years. Now I could have done because I know that if I asked my practice where I'm very well valued, I would get one. But I haven't because I actually feel that I love my job. It's a privilege. And I get paid very well. I don't get paid anywhere near as much as a consultant, but I believe I get paid very well. Do you not think that this strike is just out of sync with the timing and the feeling of the country? No, because the doctors realise that unless they take drastic action, the hemorrhage of workforce, organisational memory and experience will continue. Before, before the pandemic, we had 10,000 vacancies uh, for doctors in the NHS. Why was that? because the conditions not only pay, but working with inadequate resources, not enough beds, not enough staff. Well, hang on a minute. No, no, no. You're conflating You're out. conflating a number of things here. The, the reason we have a lack of doctors is because we didn't train enough doctors. It has no, nothing... No, it isn't. It, yes, it is. It has we, are no, the big, we are the biggest trainer for Australian and New Zealand. Right, Zealand's but Canadian also, doctors. I would argue, right, one, one of the... Doing. And I'll ask Renia her view on this, but also, I think we're training the wrong people to be doctors because we know 25% of new graduates leave after year one. They weren't the right people people to go in and that's about the admissions process as well Renault. Yeah I mean I do think it's about the admission process and the other thing Bob that we need to let people know about that many don't know is if we look at the number of junior doctors 30 years ago to compare to now there's no comparison we have 10 times as many we had 7,000 doctors 30 years ago now we've got nearly 70,000 there's a big problem here in terms of European working time directives which came into play people not wanting to work the hours that doctors used to work now I'm not saying that it was right that doctors worked 120 hours a week but there's also some middle ground here about wanting to actually stay to watch that surgery until nine o'clock at night because it will add to your experience we have we have problems so just explain that so so in our day you would say people would say do you want to see this case and of course we were because you want to learn that doesn't happen to the same degree now i have consultants telling me that they say to their junior look i've got this fantastic case you'll probably never see this again in 10 years would Mm. you like to watch me do it it's at eight o'clock tonight and they say oh no i need to go home Mm. bob yeah well what, what you're describing, you're not care, comparing like with like. So when I trained 30 years ago, you had a very strong firm structure. You were in post for at least six months. Yeah. You lived on site, rent free. You had a clean white coat every week. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, you were looked after. I agree. And, and that built goodwill. That goodwill has been completely decimated. And I agree. Now you, now you have students coming out with £100,000 worth of debt. If they do work past their hours, they don't get paid any overtime. They're exploited. I'm a GP trainer. I talk to my junior colleagues. They're coming out broken after training, right? And the reason they leave isn't because they're not suitable applicants. It's because the NHS has become toxic, dangerous, understaffed, and running on fumes. That I is do, the problem. I, I actually agree with every word you've just said there, Bob, and I have written about this and said that that when you break someone's will, when you have a workforce that is so undervalued that getting up in the morning is actually a chore, then you have a major problem. And when you have that in healthcare, you actually have a dearth of compassion because how are you compassionate for other people when nobody's compassionate for you? And and I also agree because we have spoken about this. It's all the stuff, and you are right, Bob, on this, which is that actually that the the medical staff feel undervalued. They don't have clean white coats. They don't have 
hot food. They don't actually have any uh, sort of structure that, that values care. them and, care. or care or love or attention. And I think that's where this has gone horribly wrong. I keep going back to my point, which is I think if you stay in the NHS for 10 years, we underwrite your, your training debt. and we pay back your training and because you are then held within the NHS. But also, no amount of money is going to put that goodwill back. No, no I, I agree with that. Bob, thank you so much for your thank time. You. That's Dr Bob Gill there, NHS GP and also producer of the documentary The Great NHS Heist.